This is the Seminole Wars Authority. Hello and welcome. Digging deeper. If there is one central element that binds this community of Seminole War historians, it is the passionate desire to dig deeper to find the truth. We examine this with recent guests. Jim Flaherty, Rick Obermeyer, and Jeff Snively are longtime practitioners of this historical craft as citizen scholars, and so is Chris Kimball. In the early days of the public internet, the long past 1990s, Chris set up a site to share knowledge about these wars. He even assembled a county-by-county listing of locations where the wars were fought. When blogs and video uploads became available, early technology adopter Chris dove in, presenting more knowledge and more history about these wars in one place than had existed anywhere else on the internet up to that time. He wove his knowledge with the Florida Park Service into entertaining and educational vignettes about the war, the people, and the environment. For example, Chris created a series of episodes for YouTube on the clothing of the Seminole, based on the work of Rick Obermeyer, his fellow living history reenactor. This research material supplied fodder for his three books on Seminole War battles, related newspaper articles, and of letters and diary accounts from people who lived and died during those wars. Today, Chris returns to the Seminole Wars Authority to tell us about those olden times when pickings about the Seminole Wars were far and few between to find until he weighed in. Chris Kimball, welcome back to the Seminole Wars Authority. Oh, thank you, Patrick. Glad to be back. Chris, how did you get started with all this? The public Chris Kimball, who talks about the Seminole Wars. The internet started coming on in the mid-90s, so in 96, I got my first email address and all that, and they had web pages started to pop up. I noticed there was nothing on the Seminole War, of course. Well, that shouldn't surprise anyone, but I wanted to change that. So there was a website called GeoCities where people could make their own web page of their interests. So I started building up a web page of at first, is just little tidbits in the Seminole War. From there, I started going county by county. So I had a county by county description of Seminole War places to visit. You found that was a good start, but then you needed to move on. I bought a Seminole War domain name, transferred all the things from GeoCities, then made my own webpage. And I had that till about 2007. After the internet started becoming more popular and more things added on, by that time, I was still paying for the domain name and really not getting any feedback. I have got feedback a lot at the beginning, people emailing me with comments. But after a while, decided that really didn't need to keep it if I wasn't keeping a dialogue up or conversation or question and answer. But your information was not dormant. With the same thing on the web page, we started to make a booklet. I couldn't get anybody to pick up and publish, but as the internet was coming more prolific, self-publishing became a thing. And then finally in 2013, I published my first book on the timeline, a chronology of events and battles in the Seminole War. You also made a portable display listing all of these battles that you could take to events that you spoke at. And then in 2015, the Seminole War Foundation published the Seminole War Historical Trail Guide through the Florida Department of State. And that's a free publication. You can go to the Florida Department of State Heritage Trails website and pick that up. Uh, you can download a PDF or you can even write them on the address on the web page and they'll mail you one on some of the museums and places in the booklet. We'll even have copies of the booklet, like if you go to Dade Battlefield. With the booklet out, that accomplished what I wanted to put out about the Seminole War sites in every county. And with that, I had a lot of help. I wrote some of it. John Mary Lou Missile had traveled over 5,000 miles across the state. In fact, I think that was one of the first podcasts that you did was it. Dr. Joe Kanish and Steve Rank, Frank Walmer. It was a collaboration of the best authors and researchers of the Seminole War history, and it's free. Can't go wrong with that. Mission accomplished. Now, the webpage, I started my own blog, Live Journal, and that's actually still there. I've been keeping that for, must be about, I think, 2006, 
might have been when I started the blog. That's been going along, and I also have a YouTube channel. Originally, I called it Seminole War, but when you started the podcast with the Seminole War Foundation, I figured, okay, I'll just take a YouTube channel and use my own name, Chris Kimball, so Seminole War can go to the podcast there. It doesn't bother me. Yes, and that's an ongoing project for us from the Foundation because we'd like to link with your videos when you post them. Yeah. But I have several other things there that don't have to do with the Seminole War, like uh, rants and uh, just a, a pity day things or something, history of the reenacting. or So it's a side hobby. Share with us some of your historically informed rants. I put out a video on the Battle of New Orleans because several history channels on YouTube, I heard them say that the Battle of New Orleans didn't count because the peace treaty was signed. And that made me kind of mad because they should know better. That's a myth, is that the Battle of New Orleans did matter because the British General Pakenham had orders to continue no matter what was going on with the negotiation. And the peace treaty would not be official until it was ratified by the governments of both the U.S. and the British Parliament, which would happen in February and March of the next year. So even though it had been signed, it wasn't officially ratified by the governments. It was important that the U.S. won the Battle of New Orleans so the country wouldn't be split up. The British wouldn't have seized the Louisiana Territory from the United States and stopped the westward expansion, but who knows what would have happened. There's a lot of speculation. If the British had taken New Orleans, possibly the British Parliament would not have ratified it and the treaty would be no good. After the Battle of New Orleans, which was really a campaign of several battles, the British wanted to go back to the alternate plan of taking New Orleans, coming by land through Mobile. So they went back to Mobile, surrounded Fort Boyer, put it under siege, and took the fort. The fort surrendered. There was also a British raid about the same time on the St. Mary's River, which was the border between Georgia and Spanish Florida. So there's actually a couple more battles. And there was a few more naval battles out on the high seas that happened before word got out. Word took a while to get around anyway. Well, Chris, that brings us up to date from when you started a GeoCity site with a Seminole Wars focus to publishing, to blogging, to YouTubing, and to using your knowledge to set straight the historical record when it's being misrepresented. But how did you get to the point where you felt you had the requisite knowledge and skills where you could start a GeoCity site focusing on Seminole War-related places county by county in Florida? Well, I guess maybe I'll uh, back up a bit. My mom was an anthropologist. We'd go down and visit Native American communities. That's something I grew up with. I remember seeing the Miccosukee on the same Kamiami Trail back in the early 70s. My mom once said, don't you remember when we went down there and Buffalo Tiger cooked us a cow or something? And I, I didn't remember that. Also in scouting, there was a Native American emphasis back then, the Order of the Arrow. There's really not so much now. And I've met a few people through scouting who became heavy in the reenacting, like Jimmy Sawgrass. He and I went through junior leader training when we were teenagers, so I've known him probably longer than most people outside his family, and David Ma and Rick Obermeyer. You had Rick Obermeyer on recently. Rick uh, and Pete Thompson, who put together the Seminole Men's Clothing. I got interested in making a shirt, and so I made a shirt. Reenacting started getting off the ground with the 150th anniversary of Dade's Battle in 1985. I was a spectator. I, Rick and I carpooled. Uh, Rick said, yeah, we got this event going on. So we came to the 150th anniversary day battle. And it's amazing looking back how long that's been, because what, 187 years now. And in this time, you're one of many who crossed paths. Our guest from last week, Jeff Snidely. I ran into Jeff somewhere along there. Jeff and I were just talking about people we knew and who passed away, like Ray Jerome, who passed away in 2011, uh, Ray used to have an antique store in McIntosh, Florida, off Highway 301, and I remember that. <laughs> there used to be a barn across the street. 
Jeff and people like Jesse, Dr. Sam Smith from Sanford with the Seminole War Foundation, because they know a lot, you can have a conversation with them on things that maybe not the general public knows, but more detail. And Chris, that really gets to the crux of what you and I and many others do. You've talked about how you've gotten this information out through mediums to the general public and capturing what these people know is part of what I do with this podcast. I enjoyed your recent guest, Stephen and Paulette, who talked about the military ride visiting Dade Battlefield. And he's talked about Tampa Bay History Center. One of the best events I ever did was at the Tampa Bay History Center. And one reason, because we were inside when it was thundering outside, so we didn't get wet. And another reason is that McDill Air Force Base is nearby, and several airmen and officers came up and asked really the best questions that I've ever had. They start asking about the armaments and got some more detail on the leadership. It's really refreshing when you have crammed your head full of all this information, can let it out and (laughs) have a release of uh, information on stuff that you've read, bounce it back with somebody who may have read something else or have an opinion and help refine your uh, research. In the clothing and accoutrements, early Seminole War living historians had the passion, but not necessarily the accuracy. Why was this? Doing reenacting back in the early days, actually, it started out rude that people were making cardboard forage caps and things, whatever we could, and we were dressing up with whatever curtains or dresses that could be turned into a long shirt. But then we started researching, and of course, there's a lot of good libraries around the state in Gainesville, university libraries, state library in Tallahassee. So people like Rick were already traveling around making the research for the closing book. There's a lot of books back then where the foundation for research, like Dr. Mann's book on the Second Seminole War and Bragg and a lot from the facsimile series. Certainly not as much as today, but it was a good start. Listeners will be pleased to know that the Seminole Wars Foundation itself has more than 2,250 books related to the Seminole Wars, or the Seminole in some fashion, all in one place. And you don't need a university library card to use it. We were finding out, as we were going along, a lot of resources that we would look at years earlier would tend to sometimes disappear in libraries, like ethnological research on Native Americans. So we started making our own collection, collecting books and papers and news articles. So that's why I eventually acquired about 300 books on the Seminoles and the Seminole War, and just related information like that, and a lot of books on the Creeks and Native Americans. And I have some of my mom's anthropology books on the subjects that <laughs> were passed on to me. So we amassed our own library. And And you, Chris, have been kind enough to fill in the gaps in the Seminole Wars Foundation library collection with some of the rare titles that you own. Good. You know, I like to share my information. Some of us ask, how do you find the time to research? Some of the places I've lived have been remote. In 2000, I started working at Fort Morgan, which is a barrier island at the opening of Mobile Bay. 22 miles from the nearest town of Gulf Shores. So I'm isolated out there, didn't get too many visitors, other reenactors. And then I worked down in the Everglades for 10 years, which was great because I was close to the Atopakee Museum. So I have this big library. I work at a state park in the Everglades area, part of the Everglades ecosystem. And the Atopakee Museum was not far away. It's about 80 or 90 miles, which that's considered neighbors (laughs) down there. Did have bears come up to my windows and Florida Panthers walk by my kitchen window at night. <laughs> I could go visit the museum, but I mentioned my mom's anthropology work and uh, visiting Native Americans. So we knew different Native American people across Central Florida. From the start of the webpage back in 96, I started connecting with them and meeting some of the Creek descendants in North Florida. You have some of the, I guess, the church ones and the traditional ones and all that. And from that, I met Mary Francis Johns and Archie Johns down Brighton Reservation. And I'd go visit them, gosh, that's from late 90s to about 2003, help her out with her computer when she needed work. At the time, I was living in the Orlando area. 
Brighton was about uh, three hours drive <laughs> from where I was north of Orlando. Met one of her, we'll call it cousin, in North Florida, who still see quite frequently, confirmed Mary that they were related through her cousin in North Florida. I found out later on that we're actually distantly related <laughs> there. What we start talking about relatives from our genealogy research, which is something I never expected. I never leave any stone unturned. I think it's 97 and 98. I went out to Oklahoma and was taking a few courses from University of Oklahoma. In fact, they're playing the Florida Seminoles in the Fiesta Bowl or something. Fiesta Bowl? No. They played in the prestigious Cheez-It Bowl. So I'm kind of torn on loyalty and which team to root for. You got the Seminoles West and the Seminole East. (laughs) After we recorded, the Knowles East prevailed over the Knowles West. All right, Chris, what were you doing in Oklahoma then? There was a museum program, and so I took some master courses on that. It was all mostly distant, just came for the first couple weeks of the start of the course. Was in Oklahoma, had several things happen that I thought was important for understanding to preserve the culture and the history. <laughs> I won't get into detail, but I decided either I'm in or I'm not in. And so I decided to just continue and go in whole hog in all the way and just research as much as I can. Just not too many other people were doing it. In the University of Oklahoma, they have a Western library. And since that time, it's now 25 years, I've been a member of the Oklahoma Historical Society, and they have a lot of information on the Seminoles coming from the other side of the Mississippi, which oftentimes has more information from what happened in Florida. The rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. When you embarked with the GeoCities project, who were you intending to reach? I wasn't sure who I would reach, but I just wanted to put stuff on the Internet to educate people about the Second Seminole War, which I feel is a significant part of our history. So the first thing I put out, uh, August 7th, 1840, attack on Indian Key, different accounts from the Battle of Black Point, which all make it sound like a completely different battle from about six different accounts (laughs) from different militia. And things like that, just stuff I'd research and throw up on there. After a bit, I decided to start breaking it down into counties and putting in some historical quotes. Like I took a quote from Wiley Thompson saying that all the Indians in Florida are Seminoles because they're runaway, which ignores the fact that they're not all Seminoles. You have Miccosukees, Apalachicolas, Creeks, Uchi, Ufalas different groupings that today might be considered Creeks or Seminoles. My work is never done because there's a lot of misinformation. One time I was in Okmulgee Mounds in Georgia. Some other people were looking at a display, and one guy said, oh, these mounds, they're built by Africans who came over 200,000 years ago. It's you know, just totally wrong. There was not even a Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago. What feedback did you get? I get comments, somebody who had an ancestor and wanted to learn more and buy genealogical ones. One time I get actual historical ones on people wanting to learn more about the history of like Fort Pierce or Fort Dallas, interesting ones. And then ones that claim to be related to Osceola, I get several of those a year. (laughs) It's one of the strangest ones I got was from a group of spiritualists in Jacksonville area. They said they're trying to contact the spirit of a departed chief named Red Oak. And if I knew a Indian chief by that name, so I said, I don't know, reception's cloudy, need 1500 more dollars. <laughs> so, <laughs> but so sometimes you just got to have fun with some of this. And once again, from GeoCities, you moved it. From GeoCities, I moved it over to the domain name and pretty much kept the same thing there. And the blog was just random thoughts of what I might be researching or reaction to something I heard from somebody. On the blog, if I went to a particular reenactment or something and update on how it went, things that didn't necessarily fit on the web page, current events or upcoming events. I don't think there's anyone else really making a web page on Seminole War history. 
There's a few out there now, but nobody's really dedicated as often what's on there now. It's just somebody puts something out and really doesn't do anything more with it. You continue to find fun and useful nuggets of information, sometimes in a hilarious circular pattern. Oh, <laughs> that's been frustrating to me because sometimes I'm researching something and it sounds like some good information. So I woke up where it came from and <laughs> find out that it's something I posted in my blog 10 years ago. <laughs> so it's uh, like a, in an infinite loop of finding myself as the source of information. Sometimes I don't get anywhere. <laughs> How elaborate is your production for the videos that you post on YouTube? The problem is, is right now I don't have a camera, so I just do it off my camera on my laptop and do a lecture or my cell phone, <laughs> take a short video on the cell phone. I'm not as technical savvy or the, the technology has got a bit ahead of me that <laughs> I don't have a camera to go around and film as much as I would like. When I make a video, I have to script everything out. When I do a lecture, I have to write everything out ahead of time. Some talks I've given sometimes that were interrupted or cut short, it really throws me off. I <laughs> think sometimes I write up to do an hour talk and only give it a half an hour, so I have to cut out a lot of information I wanted to give. Probably the funniest time was when I was doing my first seminal presentation at the state park I worked is like the first talk when I was brand new working there. The sewer septic station failed, so they called the septic truck to come pump it out. I'm giving my talk, and the septic truck pulls up right next to the building where I'm giving my talk, which is a screen building. So you got the truck running and the smell. It just chased away my audience and vented my presentation right there. So you discount one audience member who said that your presentation really stunk. Yeah, right. <laughs> then our time, I go on a research trip about 2010. I, I wasn't living in Tallahassee at the time. I was in southwest Florida near Naples, but I was going to do a talk at the Marco Island Historical Society. So I wanted to research Seminole history and for that area, cater a talk to a lot of local interests of what happened there and look for things that nobody really talks about or put in the history books. And so I go up to Tallahassee and so I'm doing this on behalf of the Park Service. While I'm up there researching the paper, the Park Service was at that point very micromanaging what talks people gave because in some parks they had some talks done by some groups that not necessarily approved of. The Park Service, every talk we gave, they wanted a script and everything. And so I was still up researching, hadn't even finished writing my talk, and suddenly getting a call saying that they wanted a copy of my program or a script and write it, wanted it right away. Since I hadn't really written it at that point and was still researching it, I just gave them another of my programs, which I already had in the can, and let them critique that and never told them about it. They came back with a few spelling and grammar changes. But if they don't know more than what I know on the subject, then I'm really not going to take much of their critiques on that. The three books I've done, it's been very problematic by getting anybody to critique it because who else knows about the subject? I've gotten you and Dr. Joe Kanish to help me out greatly. I guess that's good enough because it's my last book I mailed out, sent out 12 galley copies, I guess you'd call them, and only got two people to contact me back. So that's frustrating. Now, I think just other people didn't know enough about the subject and didn't want to comment any further. Dale at 2 Egg and Rachel, they put up a little five-minute information. Right now, it's the anniversary of the Battle of New Orleans. So they're putting out like daily thing, one on the battle on the 23rd. And they also put out video on the battle at Lake Bourne, the naval battle. They have a slightly larger budget and production facility than you have. Nevertheless, it's the script and the content that matters most. When you do a video, keep it on subject. The problem is sometimes I tend to ramble off and go down a tangent. And after I'd done that for 30 minutes, then I decide to trash that video and just redo it. So most of my videos I end up doing about three times till it comes out with a version that I'm happy with that I didn't ramble <laughs> too much. And you represent your research on the blog. The blog, I have things, yeah, 
uh, put on here sources that I research with, microfilm and libraries and journals. I went to the uh, post returns for Fort King. The synopsis is all the post returns from 18. 18- 27 to 42 of the history of post Fort King, how sometimes you'd have a small company there of just a few dozen soldiers, and sometimes there'd be 300. Another time, I found a letter on the first Seminole War about two dozen not slaves with black Seminoles who had been captured and a list of their names. And I just thought that that was a real good genealogy source. So I put that on my web blog, not only the transcription, but uh, copies of the actual letter from the microfilm. Chris, where did you come up for ideas? Once I left the Park Service, I had all these good presentations, but I didn't know if I'd ever be able to give them again to a group. I put them on YouTube. So I had the four part series on seminal clothing, which uh, had developed a program on the history of seminal clothing. Some of that comes from the presentations I had in the parks. I know there's several websites or information about seminal clothing, but nobody else goes through the history that front was plain shirts, and then there's color, and then there's colored stripes, and then the sewing machines came around, and they started creating patchwork. Nobody else seems to go through the progression in history, and that's what I like to do is show how it changed over time and what happened. When it comes to Osceola, everything out there is historically accurate, right? During the Seminole War, Osceola would get a lot of credit for things or places he never was at. So I look through the records and find where there's definite documentation that he was there. I'm finding out that it was pretty much all confined around Ocala area, what today is Marion, Alachua County, maybe a little bit into Sumter County. One time Osceola went to Fort Brook in Tampa Bay when Sam Jones convinced all the 700 Seminoles there to leave the camp in the middle of the night. And Osceola was one of the ones who came there, but that's usually further than what he would go out <laughs> of his range documenting what battles he was actually at. I can only find about eight or ten battles that Osceola participated in to show that he was not the one really driving the resistance so much or resisting removal. He was one of many leaders in the war. So I like to show different trends and strategies in the war, like you've talked about. Definitely you're showing that, and also from the archaeology work that Gary Ellis and some of the archaeologists have done, is that you can see from the seminal warfare that there's definite strategies and patterns that chiefs fight around the area of their village. The jumper, who is one of the main leaders at Dade's Battle, his village is right nearby in Sumter County. There's a certain area they operate, and you really have to do that when you're considering logistics and food and the people back at the village, the women and children that you're trying to protect. Yeah, it's more defensive war for the Seminole Miccosukee people. Osceola did roam over the central portion of the Seminole Reservation on the Florida Peninsula. He was not at the Dade Battle. The Seminole said he had personal business elsewhere. Osceola was uh, killing the Indian agent Wiley Compton strategy for that day was Osceola's doing that. The Earth Seminoles, they had wanted to ambush Dade maybe earlier, but got tired of waiting. At the same time, on the uh, East Coast and St. John's River, you have the Miccosukees under King Philip, Amasala, and Wildcat or Kawakachi are burning the different sugar plantations along with the Uchi, Uchi Billy, and Uchi Jack. You can see a pattern of uprising. There's also attack of the settlements and plantations in Alachua County, which might have been alligator. It's, it's not quite clear who was doing all of that. Osceola did get to the battle celebration in the Wahoo Swamp that evening, a distance of some 40 miles. People did travel quite a distance during that time, and it is possible, reading the history of the Apache out west, Geronimo and several of the Chiricahuas, they actually trained to be distance runners from the days of the church missions that they could run 100 miles nonstop. So it is possible Osceola, since he was the leader of that raid, he probably did ride a horse. Another fantastic distance is Wildcat or Kawakichi escaping St. Augustine and being at the Battle of Okeechobee exactly one month after. Gosh, that's about 300 miles that he would have to travel. So 
<laughs> so that's quite a distance. It definitely wasn't easy back then, and Florida was not the paradise that it is today with where we have air conditioning, is that it was really a struggle for survival of everyone involved. One thing that I just did on the YouTube, on the video side, uh, everybody has playlists, and I just had one playlist, <laughs> Seminole War, 100-something videos, and I figured that's a bit too much, so I broke down the playlist into several different ones, dealing with Fort visits to forts like Fort Christmas. And I have some ideas. I want to do more little information like what Fort Brook is and the history of that. That's a video on my mind that I want to get out things like that. I did several videos on the books that I've acquired and researched on which ones are good. <laughs> and so I broke it down in categories, general history of the war, eyewitness books there, are eyewitness accounts, Dr. Mott or Lieutenant Prince, and Bemrose, things like that. And also I did one on the Black Seminole books, which there's not enough on that subject. Hopefully we'll see more. And then there's books on the First Seminole War and the Third Seminole War, which is not as commonly known. People really don't <laughs> seem to understand, understand the First and Third Seminole War. Of course, the Seminoles look at it as one big war, but there's not too much information out there on what the First and the Third War actually were, what caused it, on what the first battle of the First Seminole War was. The historian disagree among ourselves seems to be just a number of things, anything from uh, Prospect Bluff, Negro Fort, or it could be the attack on Lieutenant Scott on the Apalachicola River right before the Chattahoochee River on November 30th, 1817. Or you can even go back to the War of 1812 when Daniel Noonan and the Georgia militia attacked King Payne in Painstown, the battle in 12 Mile Swamp, where the Marine Captain Williams was killed. And something I found out interesting researching is that at first he was buried in St. Mary's, but now he's uh, reinterred in Arlington. John Casey's an interesting character. He is uh, in the 3rd Artillery Regiment. I think he was born in 1809. He was an Army officer, but he was in Florida during Seminole War in one time or the other. Supposedly, he was fluent in the Seminole language. He became Indian agent, working a little bit with the removal of the Seminoles. John Casey just seemed very, I wouldn't say understanding so much, but very uh, empathetic towards the Seminoles. He became sort of the Indian agent towards the Seminoles. It's good you said sort of. After Wiley Thompson was violently removed as the Indian agent for the Seminole by Osceola at Fort King, I'm not sure many people were eagerly vying for that open position. There was a separate branch of the government, like you had the Secretary of War, you had also the Department of Indian Affairs, and it would be staffed by Army officers, and John Casey became one. And he actually wrote a diary, a lexicon of seminal words and language. <laughs> so <laughs> I took it to uh, somebody who actually spoke the language to see what they thought. They said it was like street language <laughs> there. Then we know about items of Osceola that were plundered when Osceola died, taken by Frederick Whedon and Captain Pitt Karen Morrison, who infamous for some incidents later on with the Bascom affair in the Apache Wars that put Cochise on the warpath. Anyway, the Osceola items, they ended up in Washington, D.C., Major James Hook, who was in charge of Indian subsistence, had an obscene collection of Indian artifacts that he had gotten from all the tribes that he was supposed to be providing food for, something we would consider a bit unethical today. That's okay, because the Seminoles seem to appreciate turnabout as fair play. If you go into any of the Seminole Tribe of Florida-owned cafes for the Hard Rock International, you see a lot of artifacts albeit from rock and roll musicians. Trivial in comparison to seminal artifacts. <laughs> Major Hook, he died about 1840. John Casey actually bought the Osceola items from Major Hook. As far as we know, he may have given them to Billy Bolegs, who was a good friend of his on some of those things, returned them to the Seminoles. Apparently, you got to do some sleuthing about John Casey. Casey had given specific instructions for the dispatch of his remains should he die in Florida, but there's no record of his remains occupying a grave in the Tampa vicinity. John Casey, 
he wanted to be buried somewhere around Fort Brook. Finally, we determined that it was a place that was in Tampa today, not far from the main area of the fort. But it's gone from there. Apparently, his family took his remains and reburied him in New York, which was a surprise because we kept looking for where he might be buried around Tampa or Egmont Key. Found it on Find a Grave that he's buried up in New York. Find a Grave is a good resource, but it's problematic. We have Colonel John Green of the 6th Infantry is listed as being buried in three places because back then when you get the body shipped home, they still have it listed being at the former site. Yes. And for Casey, his family brought him back up to Brooklyn for the family plot. We focused on Casey's written words stating where he wanted to be buried, and that was not at the family grave in Brooklyn. Colonel Green, he's listed as one of the people buried in St. Francis and St. Augustine. Turns out he died at the Grove Mansion in Tallahassee, the home of Richard Keith Call, and they buried him there in the cemetery where Call and also former Governor Wilroy Collins and their families are buried. There's no marker for him in that cemetery, and you can actually visit there today at the Grove. Turns out his family buried him in Washington, D.C., and uh, might have been the Congressional Cemetery. I can't remember which cemetery offhand. One guy he's listed in being buried in three different cemeteries. When I was in the Army, I was stationed at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, for two and a half years. What I do at every place, I get out and learn the history and the culture, and learning the history of the Apache out around that area of Arizona, Geronimo, and the Apache Wars. About 10 years ago, Siegfried Jumper, Siggy Jumper, put out his first book about the search for his family that had been one of those Chiricahuas from Arizona that had gone to Fort Marion. His great-grandfather or one of his ancestors had been taken to Cuba as, I guess, indenture enslaved people as human trafficking family came back from Cuba in the 1950s, and he grew up in Miami area, got to know the Seminoles. So it really appealed to me knowing the history of both the Seminoles and the Apache. Many of the places he talks about in his book, researching his ancestry and his Apache heritage, have actually been to places that I've been to. So I really enjoy reading about his adventure and finding his family. And he has a second book out about the Apache Holocaust, as he calls it, a deliberate effort by the Spanish and then the American army to exterminate the Apaches, as he says. Very good information on that, so I recommend that as well. Tell us more about the talks that you've given to the public. I did a talk at the Waxahachie commemoration last April. I want to put it out both on the blog and the video, same talk to outline it, because I know everybody couldn't be there, and it might be an interest to a lot of people, so I just wanted to put the information out on firsthand sources. One thing I've done the past few years is be a judge on the high school National History Day, and so we have, in Florida every May, we have the National History Day where students from across the state do presentations and I've been a judge on the essay papers. Some are very good. For the researchers, there's what we call primary sources and secondary sources. And this is what they teach you in high school and college to look for. So I just wanted to put that information out, too, because some people quoting secondary sources, which aren't people who are actually there. But when you're doing research, you have to go as far back or back to the original source as you can get to really get the information on what actually happened. You can read several accounts of the same battle, and they're probably describing a different battle entirely. And the Battle of Waxahachie is actually one of those where you have several different accounts, but depending on what they saw and what they were standing, it seems like it's totally different. Now, there's several accounts from the Battle of Okeechobee, many accounts from the Battle of Wislacoochee under General Duncan Clinch, So there's a lot of different sources. In fact, there's a lot of eyewitness accounts and books and information that appeared in print in 1836 during the first year of the war because it was the popular thing. Not so much so during the latter half of the war where everybody was just sick of the war and not writing as much. But there are sources out there of accounts that you can read. 
Well, it's interesting is that the Internet's opened a whole new area of research and things that we haven't known. So I go on newspaper.com and have a subscription with Ancestry that gets me different sources there. And newspaper.com, there's several eyewitness reports. There was a man named Dembo Factor who ended up with the, the Buffalo Soldiers out west in Texas. Turns out he was a eyewitness to Dade Battle in 1835. It says that he was a helper of assistant Micanopy, like uh, getting Micanopy's horse prepared. And that's an eyewitness account of somebody we hadn't heard about before. And it's just these things. So research is never done because you think something that happened 187 years ago, we would have found everything about it, but it's not true. It's as if we're just finding little pieces now and then. Another piece of information I found, I found that Major Dade had a second child. He had two daughters. His oldest daughter, Fanny Dade, she's buried in Pensacola. In her gravestone, it says the only daughter of Major Dade. Well, that's not true. Major Dade and his wife Amanda had a second child who died 18 months old. I think born when Dade was recruiting up in Albany, New York, and died at Fredericksburg and is buried in Fredericksburg. And so I was going through the uh, cemetery records or newspaper accounts and genealogy sources saying who's buried in this cemetery. And I came across Lorenza, Virginia Lorenza Dade, uh, unusual name, but he named it after his brother as well. She died at 18 months old and is buried in unmarked grave in Fredericksburg. So I actually wrote the cemetery. They said, yes, it's an unmarked grave. And also the historical society and the library there were the original newspaper, what you call the obituaries, to find out if it was actually the daughter of Major Dade. And it says Major Dade. It doesn't give his first name, but there's only one Major Dade in the Army at that time. Uh, so it removes all doubt. But interesting is that he has a second daughter. We're just making more information available for people. One goal we always wanted to do is that the Second Seminole War was a major war that involved half the U.S. Army and almost been virtually forgotten about today. And we're just trying to ch change that and put information out. I think we're slowly coming about and doing that. More people are finding out about the information. We're making more information available for people who want to find out more. I'm a member of the National Association of Interpreters. I'm a lifetime member just from what we did in the Park Service. What I want to do is just give people the full experience that there's more than one way to educate people and have resources, make a provocative moment doing something through the living history or the talks. Just have many different sources of information or way that people can relate to and Another thing is one of my traits is that I don't want to leave a stone unturned, which is why I amassed a big library and make a list of every battle that happened during the Second Seminole War, make a complete list of everything I could think of. I'll leave it out there in a way that people can take what they want and hopefully it'll enrich our history and tell us more about how we relate as a people in society and how we got here and what happened in the past thing about the historians is that we all pretty much get along, but we all have our differences in Venom every now and then. At the end of the day, we're all researching the same thing, the same goal to teach people the history and the rich cultures of Florida. So we'll <laughs> just promote that. Chris Kimball, once again, thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars Authority. Okay, thank you. This podcast is copyright 2023. The Seminole Wars Foundation, all rights reserved. Find us on the web at seminolewars.podbean.com or seminolewars.us. Front and back bumper music courtesy of the U.S. Navy Band.